book is a book is is a problem about why me? It's the same problem in the Old Testament, you know, where you know, why me? Why did you choose me, God? And God's like, well, I don't know. You know like, I picked you. Like you're assigned, and that's sort of what's happening here. Is that Ishmael is assigned to the job of surviving, and he needs to make sense of it. And I think that is the way in which the Bible part of the book really manifests itself in that question: Why did why did why did this good thing happen when everything bad happened to everybody else? Why did I survive? I don't feel like my younger students are necessarily the ones who don't grok it, but I really think this book is harder for women. It's just harder for people who think narratively as opposed to, and I don't want to, I hate, I hate, the one problem with this whole setup is I don't want to gender the way people read, but I do think that the 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 average reader of fiction is has a harder time with this book than the average reader of fact. Is that mm. well I'm not sure about that. I mean our experience at the bookstore is we do a lot of women do come in and ask uh, or say I've struggled with reading it. But a lot of men have come in and said I have struggled with reading it. Yes. And I think we for a while took a sort of a uh, sort of a sabbatical from having the marathon, but you know, coming back to it, we, you know, I personally look at it as the the Pequod is all of us, and and the, and the characters are have gender uh, qualities across the spectrum. I do think and that's true. And so that you know, I think it's important for all readers to to not necessarily over identify the characters with the sex of them. But that to see them as having, you know, the gen gender qualities that we all we all share. Yes. So I mean, I think that's really kind of important, and and I think also, I mean, the marathon is great for those of you who haven't been. I hope you will come this yeah. year because the language of Melville is astonishing, and it, it you have to hear it out loud. Mm -hmm. You you really have to hear it out loud to truly be able to. It, it, um, Realize the genius uh, that is set forth on the pages. So, um, and and hearing it read out loud can get you through those chapters that are a little bit difficult. And I'll just say one more thing. And I'll toss it back yeah, to you. Yeah, but true. the cytology chapters, which everybody kind of chokes on. I mean, the more you hear, the more you see. It's, it's full of humor. I mean, he's making jokes out about the fact that you can't quantify the whale right. or, or the deity. It, it's not possible. Right. So um, anyway, I just really, we wanted to talk about right. opening it up for, for women and just say, look at it. I love the idea of looking at it from the point of view of Ishmael's being like the traumatized survivor, and look, he's the he's the son of Hagar, you know, right. the the Ishmaelite, right. uh, you know, the um, so there's a whole other aspect to the fact he's yeah. an outcast yeah. himself. And so tossing it back to you. No, but so I think this is a really important thing to um, that you said so many things I want to respond to, um, but I first want to talk about Ishmael. So the book begins with. I mean, you all know those three words, don't we? <laughs> so call me. He says, call me, yeah, call me, Ishmael. <laughs> but he's not saying, my name is Ishmael. He's saying, I am the outcast son of my family. I am the one who was sent away. My father replaced me with another child. It is interesting that he's the second child and not the first child, because Ishmael, of course, was the first child, but um, but he, you know, Ishmael goes on to be the father of all the other religions that are not Christianity. So he has a quite a good, you know, bio record. But but he's saying, call me not, but not in America. No, and call, yes, and not in America of 1851 right. in particular. Yeah. So he's saying, um, he's saying, call me the other guy. But also, the name Ishmael means. God will hear. Call me the guy that God will hear. Mm. So again, coming back to this idea of the of of the book as like my trauma document, you know, he's really saying like, call me that guy. Call me the guy who's going to figure it out in 
300, 400 pages. <laughs> how could I still not know how many pages there were? Six, 600 pages. Yeah. So I, I'm going to just do this one thing because I want to. So Catherine uh, says, and she's correct, that when you hear these words, they are, they have. I mean, we joke about this in creative writing class, they have mouth feel. <laughs> they are very easy to say out loud. Sometimes you read a book and you can't quite get the, the pacing when you read it out loud. You, you say like, oh, I want to I read a little bit of um, <clears throat> As I Lay Dying, and maybe you'll stumble over an organization of a paragraph. You can't do that here. And one of the reasons, I am not a poet, but one of the reasons is that he is largely writing in iambic pentameter. So the, the flow is just mm. super. It's not everywhere, but it's most places. Whenever he can, he does. And so it just sort of rolls out of your mouth. So, OK. Uh, so the first paragraph, call me Ishmael. Call me, God will hear. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely. So he's saying, this happened in the past. It didn't, this is not, I, I am not telling you a story that it, we're going along on the story together. He's saying, I'm telling you a story from the past. And why that's critically important is a lot of times in the book, you'll be unsure of um, why some detail is being given to you. And you have to say, Oh wait, he knows this whole story. He's picking this to tell me. And then all of a sudden, it makes a different sense. So the cetology, for example, these kind of, um, you know, not as much fun sections. We could say, not as much fun. But they, first of all, they are funny. Secondly, there's often little tiny minutiae of plot in there. So it's worth looking at. It's, it's really worth looking at those chapters and reading them with the same painstaking slowness that you might read a chapter which is about story in the sort of, in the more story sense. There's a huge part of this book where story disappears and you just have to go with it, but often embedded in one of those very complicated, po potentially dull chapters there is a little piece of text that um, will help you get to the next thing that you need to know. Okay, so some years ago, never mind how long precisely, having little or no money in my purse, remember we know this about him, not Ishmael, but Herman, and nothing particular to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. I believe this is extant true to his life experience. It's not a fiction. Okay, so it is a way I have of driving off the spleen and regulating the circulation. Whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, whenever it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially whenever my hypos get such an upper hand of me that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping into the street and methodically knocking people's hats off, <laughs> then I account it high time to get to see as soon as I can. This is my substitute for pistol and ball. With a philosophical flourish, Cato throws himself upon his sword. I quietly take to the ship. There is nothing surprising in this. If they but knew it, almost all men, in their degree, some time or other, cherish very nearly the same feelings towards the ocean with me. We all live here, we, or around here, you know, or, you know. We know this feeling of the ocean giving us something that is not available anywhere else, right? Did anybody have any, hear anything in that paragraph that they want to... Yeah, in, in my readings, I, I realized this after I spoke before that each time I was assigned to read it in, in different levels of school, as an English major, I might have been reading Hemingway in another class and right. um, Sir Walter Scott, or and I was always comparing with those male authors 
the development of female characters or lack thereof. Right. And um, and I and I think with with Melville, what I had started doing with those other authors is trying to figure out who the author was before I read what other people thought was right. wonderful literature. And somewhere in the recent years, I discovered that Melville spent his last years in Manhattan with his wife and right. family, and he was descending into terrible depression. Yeah. One of his sons committed suicide, yeah. they were penniless, and his wife actually, I think, got him out to Bayport here on the island one really? summer to stay with her relatives, um, to, thinking he would, would raise his spirits. But he was extremely depressed and right. bankrupt. Right, right. And the book so that, that he helped was me say, yeah. okay, the guy was nuts, so now I can read the book. Well, <laughs> he really, I mean, he had a tough beginning. And I think, you know, one of the things that I think about with him and I find really fascinating as a kind of a, um, a, a, a type of life that I think we see often, I think sometimes about people that we knew when we were first married and our kids were small and they were like enormously wealthy and I would go to lunch at their house and they had you know somebody serving and then their fates like what happened to them in the ensuing I don't even want to think about how many years like fate is not is not written in our beginnings and um, and I do think, though, that people who begin with a lot often feel that it's unjust when they lose it, you know. And it, yeah. Hawthorne, in his relationship, um, really focusing yes. Melville on, you know, digging deeper into crafting this novel. Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, so I don't. I I I don't think about Hawthorne the way that I think about Melville, I, I'm sorry to say, but I will, I will say I find, I find the, um, the idea that, um, that Melville wrote almost, you know, out of, a, uh, his obsession was not simply with the whale, it was also with pleasing this person who he judged to be a superior writer and a superior talent and thinker and it is I like when I read the two of them I, I like Hawthorne but Melville is just a powerhouse to me you know of, of emotional depth and complexity so I think when I think about them I think about them in the in this sort of again it's the same story of you know how I don't know what Hawthorne's writing about is very much of his time, and it, you know, I think probably everyone in this room read Scarlet Letter as a, as a, in what eighth grade or something, and I, I we just recently we read it maybe five or six years ago, and it is sadly does not speak the way this does to now. But. Yes. The, temp the contemporary relationship there yeah. sparked something huge. Yeah, and in fact, uh, you know, there, there, there is a, there's a wonderful biography of Melville by um, Andrew Del Banco, I think, is the name Andrew Del Banco, and he talks about how um, the original draft of this book, a lot of the people Ahab wasn't in the book. He Starbuck was the head of the of the boat, was the captain of the boat, and a guy named Bulkington who has two very beautiful um, moments in the book where he is praised, you know, to the stars, but then he disappears completely. He also was a main character in the original draft of the book. I, I, people really love thinking about this, because this is, you know, Hawthorne really had an enormous Im effect on how how the book ended up. And I think it is really interesting to think about. I also think that the madness of this book probably was in that earlier book in some way, but Ahab is just such a remarkably complicated 
uh, obsessed, uh, crazy, authoritarian figure that, you know, without Ahab, I'm not sure that the book would be speaking to us in our time the way that it does. And so that you can thank Hawthorne for. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? I just, um, you know, I avoided Moby Dick for, for decades and um, and totally had, I had so many uh, misconceptions about it. And the fact that it just opens on the first page with this really like deep self-exam, psychological self-examination, right. to me, I, I uh, was just so moving and you know that the narrator is going to be doing more of it, you know, exploring his interior his interior, which I don't think of as, you know, Moby, <laughs> Moby Dick as necessarily being, you know, so, um, you know, emotionally resonant. Yeah. To a Ruby woman or a man. In the back the yeah, book. yeah. So Amy is basically, uh, is, is saying that she didn't realize that this character, Ishmael, what was so, had such emotional resonance and was thinking about his inner life and it's true, but there are parts of the book, and they are many, where you have to look for, with that open heart, you have to look for Ishmael's interiority because he is dryly taking you through, uh, um, oh, I don't know, one of the ones that I quite love is the one where they dissect the whale's penis. You know, like there are just, like he takes you through all of these sort of strange technical details and you have to look for him that's why i'm saying when you get to those chapters and you start to think about um uh um where he is hiding and why he's telling that story the those sections become more emotionally resonant and one other thing i realized i really want to just say is so one other strange feature of this book is that it is structured around nine games so yeah, seven. seven games I think it's seven. thank you yeah i never do numbers right so. <laughs> which is a magic seven is a biblically oh, is an important number. number yes so each one of these Gams. They are meetings between the, the Pequod and these other ships. They have the the path of those meetings, and you know the the ships are early on. The ships are coming back, and everything's great. You know they've had a good voyage. They're full of whale oil, and they're happy, and they go deeper and deeper into the darkness and so the two boats that they see right before they have their run-in with Moby one of them I mean is literally like the the you know this like dark you know r ragged ship where you can't see anybody one's been taken over by a cult leader um, but the last ship uh, is a ship where the captain has his two his two sons are on the boat and um, and one of them dies and the other one has been swept out to sea and he asks Ahab's help in um, in finding his son they're they're in the middle of nowhere and Ahab's like nope gotta do this thing gotta get that whale and all of the decision making this sort of descending into hell really that these boat tr these boat meetings uh, uh, really elucidate. I mean, it's just, they are a, f a, a really wonderful organizational principle of the book, and they don't start in the immediate beginning of the book. I think the first one is pretty, is maybe about 150 pages in. But once they start, you have this regular meeting of, um, of Pequod and ship, and those are really great also as um, ladder rungs to mm hold on to if the book feels like it's defeating you. Because you will get another one. You will get seven of them. <laughs> Other questions? Other thoughts? Oh, Nick, maybe this is the time. 
to talk a little bit about your idea. Um, oh, well, the other night we were talking about the book, and, and I know what I found frustrating when I first read it in high school was all the sort of side trips and digressions. And so we were, I had a music teacher in college who was talking about the way different pieces of music build, and some are very straight ahead, and, and they just you know, go straight to the uh, crescendo, and then others are more meandering and circular. And the, the examples that he gave, one was Bolero, and the other was Be My Baby by the Ronettes. And, <laughs> and, and basically the same song, and the, one is famously used in the movie 10, and the other in Dirty Dancing. But, but that idea that like the circularity of a thing can still be building and still come to a satisfying climax, and that those that meandering quality is not a bug, it's a feature. It actually is better for it. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the experience of Moby Dick is like, <clears throat> the experience you have reading the book, and, and the reason I think it's a soul book, is because of all that stuff, that right. extra stuff. Because yeah. if it were just a page turner, it would be like Jaws with better vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> with really great mouthfeel. Yeah. 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 That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Because I, I think, I think it's really true. Again, in creative writing classes, we are often saying to people, "Take that out. It's not. It's getting in the way of your arc." You know. And I, I really think that's not a good choice. Always. Sometimes it is really true that we have to leave that stuff in because it's going to help us eventually when we get to the end. And I do think that at the end of this book, at the the now end of this book, that um, we we have learned everything we need for the ending to pay off, and um, there would be a um, a uh, a less uh, knowledgeable ending. You could still you know you could still have everybody destroyed by Moby, but this way when you get there, you know every single thing that happens. And I will say we have been, so we're pretty early on in the book right now in our reading. We're kind of ch uh, chapter 16. So we just read the Jonah and the whale sections. And so very early in the book, Ishmael spends a lot of time establishing his relationship to Jonah, a guy who denied God and ran away and tried to get away from living the life that he was supposed to live, and um, and God catches him, <laughs> you know, he gets caught, and he, and then when he repents, he's inside the whale. So he's obviously you don't live if you're inside a whale, but somehow he ends up being spat out, brought back to life, and able to tell the story. And again, I think that thinking of Ishmael in those terms really will help you to feel um, the beauty of the book. And also, every time it starts to drag for you, stand up and read it out loud like mm -hmm. I just did. Mm -hmm. Because you'll find stuff in there. Just so, And don't speed through the bad chapters. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you just to talk a little, I know we're just coming to a close, but the, the chapter about the birthing of the whales and the, the, the female whales. Mm -hmm. um, that's another place in the book where the, the feminine is very evident. Mm -hmm. Oh, so that is very interesting mm -hmm. to me. I think you're absolutely right, and I guess I've never really thought of it in those terms. Mm -hmm. But of course, you're absolutely right. And, you know, Moby had to have a mom at some point. So did Ishmael. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just, I mean, that is that is so true. That's really excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Any thoughts? I don't know if anybody in the room has any. Um, I'd just like to pose a question to the women in the room who have read the book and who have liked the book or loved the book. Could you testify and say why? <laughs> Anybody? Anybody? Start, start with the language. I mean, start with the beauty of the language. Um, but, I, but I have to confess, too, it took me coming to the marathon. Yes. 
you know, not, not this is not meant as self-promotion here, but, you know, I avoided the book in school. I couldn't deal with it. Oh, that's a guy book. Right. But, uh, you know, I love poetry, and, and the, so the poetry drew me in, and the more I learned about the book, the more fascinating it becomes. Um, I mean, there's so much in there, so that's one point. Anybody else? Yeah. 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 Um, Speak out. <laughs> um, I had never read the book until my husband and I read it to one another in preparation for the marathon. Oh, lovely. And that, it just came, a, it was such a gorgeous experience. Um, and we could appreciate, you know, we could kind of grimace when there were parts and then kind of wonder because neither of us had read the book wow. so we discovered it together and then getting to the marathon was like this big celebration <laughs> um, and the part that I read was my favorite part which was the nursery mm. which mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. I think is a beautiful it's it's yeah. uh, there's that's as feminine as it gets that nurturing yeah. sense of the and I think that's why it meant so much Possibly, I didn't. I've never put that together. But um, this this sudden feminine expression in the midst of all of this other stuff mm. felt like such a. Uh, it was um, it was balm for the soul, really. Mm. But I yeah. So love that. You see, one never stops learning things about this book, and I've just never seen. I've never seen those sections as being about women and that's crazy that I've missed that and I just I think there's so much in this book it just keeps giving you more mm. I love that thanks mm -hmm. Well, I sort of had to read it because my husband's a Melville scholar <laughs> <laughs> and I tried and tried and, and had a very difficult time with it and I went to a reading in New York at which the um, actor Paul Dano read mm -hmm. the first part of it and it was funny Mm -hmm. I mean, he, yeah. it, it, there was so much humor yeah. that I thought, oh, there's there's something here that, you know, is appealing. And so I think the first time I read it, beginning to end, I kept looking for the humor oh, that's great. and yeah. saw it quite a bit. I have a question here. Do you think that, that Melville's contemporaries, the readers, the women who were reading books at that time might have it might have been more accessible to them because of the biblical and religious references and and also because whaling was more a part of their lives mm. Mm -hmm. so i think that's a great question and it's hard to know who those 37 <laughs> people were but obviously other people read the book as well i mean i don't know i don't know how to answer that i just don't know i um I, I, a dissertation. Yeah, it's a really great question that somebody should really answer. I just, I would, I, I, I don't want to go out on a limb on something there where I have no idea. So one, one would think that that families of people who were in the whale.